right? Like there's two main problems with social media right now that we think decentralized social media can solve. One um, is that these networks don't really share the value they capture with the users creating those value, the value on that platform. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Michael McGinnis. If you don't know who he is, he's a software engineer and co-founder of GM.xyz, a free Web3 social platform for communities such as DAOs and NFT projects. Mike, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing great. So um, I would love to hear your story. Let's talk about how in the world you got into crypto and ultimately into this project that you're working on right now. Start wherever you want to start. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my path into crypto wasn't super traditional. Um, so I, I did study, I studied finance and computer science in college. Um, I worked at a hedge fund for four years after that. Mm -hmm. um, eventually I got kind of bored. Like I wanted to get back into programming. I found myself like getting back into programming after work. Like I go and just practice programming after work. And um, I decided I want to go full time um, into tech. Uh, I wasn't super into crypto at the time. I was really into Bitcoin. But I, I thought like a lot of the other projects like Ethereum and all the other different uh, cryptocurrencies out there were kind of scams. Um, Bitcoin was the only real kind of product that had what I viewed as like product market fit. It made a lot of sense. What um, year was so, this, by the way? Just so we have context, how many years ago was this? This was, I, I bought my first Bitcoin back in early 2018. So basically I saw the price, right? Like the price went up to like 19000 dollars and then it crashed to thirty five hundred dollars or something like that and I, I was following it loosely like i follow all the uh tech uh thought leaders on twitter and i saw a bunch of really smart people still kind of going all in on crypto and devoting their careers to it and i thought that was super interesting and because it kind of just seemed like a pop bubble to me and um i'm like okay like these people are still like doubling and tripling down on it maybe there's something there so i kind of um Right, I, a, lot, a lot of times when I want to kind of learn about something, I'll just order the best book um, on that topic. So I, I Googled what's the best bit book on Bitcoin, um, came across uh, the Bitcoin standard, standard by Stephanie Navas. I read that book and it instantly clicked, right? You have all these kind of banks around the world um, printing uh, copious amounts of money. And then it like dives into what makes for good money versus bad money and why Bitcoin is superior to other forms of money. And it just made a lot of sense. And then I got into Bitcoin um, then and there. And then um, my plan when I quit my hedge fund job was to go into traditional Web2 software, um, uh, kind of traditional Silicon Valley type startup stuff. Um, so I went to go get my MBA, um, ended up dropping out of uh, the MBA program at Columbia after my first year uh, to join a startup called Common Stock. Um, I was there for a, a little over a year where I worked as a software engineer, I, um, which is great. I got to learn how to write production grade code um how product processes should be run they had a really great head of product um and i learned from a bunch of talented employees there um but starting in about april of last year uh my brother who's also a software engineer um we always kind of shoot uh uh kind of go back and forth on different startup ideas and i normally have a million startup ideas a minute and he's more reserved and calculated and he'll tell me most of my ideas are bad um but there's this idea of decentralized social media that people in kind of crypto have been talking about for years. Really smart people like Balaji Srinivasan, uh, Naval Ravikant have kind of been talking about this idea of central, this decentralized social media and all the kind of good that could arise from it if you kind of take power out of the hands of like these tech oligarchs. Um, and I always thought that was super compelling and nobody had really built a good one. And I was kind of explaining my thoughts around it uh, to my brother and my brother like really liked the idea. He's like, this is actually a good idea. Um, we should do this. And we decided somebody's going to build this eventually. Um, why not us? And then we quit our jobs in September to start GM. September of which year? Of uh, last year. So we're a little over, was it, uh, we quit our jobs on September 17th and pushed our first code commit that weekend. So what is today's day? Today's April 18th, right? So we're a little over seven months, uh, about seven months exactly. Why don't you explain to those that are not super crypto savvy what GM means and why you chose that name and then tell everybody a little bit about what your tool does. Yeah, sure. Uh, so GM is kind of the mantra of crypto Twitter, right? It means good morning. It stands for good morning. And it's just kind of a nice thing people say to each other, right? And like, <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounds really silly, but people will just tweet GM and then everybody will just respond GM and just say good morning to each other. And it's just kind of like a good vibe. Uh, 
uh, thing that people do in the crypto space. Um, and we thought that captured the ethos of crypto really well. And I was kind of shocked that the domain was available, gm.xyz. It, it, I, and I, re I registered it in October. So it was, it was available until October of last year, which seems kind of crazy because the meme has been around for uh, definitely since the summer of last year. I, I'm not probably a lot earlier. Okay, so tell everybody, just give everybody a little bit of like um, the the early version of your story. You decided to go all in on developing this platform. Tell us a little bit about what happened in the beginning. Tell us a little bit more of that story, obviously, because there's always a story when it comes to software development, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so my brother and I are both engineers. Uh, my brother's a much better engineer than I am, uh, but we were, uh, we were, uh, we just, as soon as we quit our jobs, we just started writing code that weekend and we got an MVP up in two weeks. And our kind of plan, the way we were thinking about the whole thing in general is, right, like there's two main problems with social media right now that we think decentralized social media can solve. One um, is that these networks don't really share the value they capture with the users creating those value, the value on that platform, right? Like, so if you think about Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, right, all the users there kind of create all the value. Um, and they they aren't compensated really in any way, right? Like a person who created Wall Street Bets um, didn't see a penny from that, even though it has 11 million members in that suburb. So that's one problem. And then the other problem we want to solve is all these tech giants have basic, there's like a handful of tech giants that have a data monopoly and they control all the social media data of the entire world. And they get to decide what the whole world sees and doesn't see. And then also the fact that they own that data and nobody else can build on top of it really stifles innovation in space. So those are the two problems we want to solve. And then basically, how do we get there, right? Like how do you build a social media network from scratch? And our plan was um, to solve this empty room problem is to build like the best home for Web3 communities. So if you look at it, there's a ton of DAOs, NFT projects, and everybody's using Discord right now. And Discord really stinks for that use case. Um, it, Discord's a great, it, it's a chat app, um, right? Like similar to Slack, it's great for real-time communication and hashing things out quickly but it doesn't really scale, um, right? Once you get into hundreds of people, let alone tens of thousands of people trying to use a chat room to communicate, it just becomes a massive mess. Um, it's madness, yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah, madness. so we started, we thought like a forum style platform would be better for commu really large communities like that. And then it had basic uh, Web3 uh, primitives in it. So that's what we started building. So we kind of copied Reddit's, um, the way Reddit has subreddits and the way they have posts with Reddit comments, we thought that was really great. And then we started layering in some native Web3 solutions. So on Discord, a bunch of people use bots like Collabland to um, for token gating, right? Like, so if you own this and you can only access this if you own this NFT, right? We built that natively into the platform. And we basically wanted to make spinning up a Web3 community on GM as easy as uh, spinning up a subreddit. Um, and that was what we set up building. So we just started writing a ton of code. Um, I kind of wrote about like the long-term vision of how you could solve a lot of the hardest problems in social media that resonated with a lot of people. People started telling each other about it. And then people started asking to uh, create their own communities. And we didn't have, we actually still don't have a way for people to create communities of their own. Um, and we create them all for people, but people started creating their own communities about all different types of interests. And um, we've been trying to keep up from there. Well, it's a pretty cool tool. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more later about how, how it works, but I would agree with you. It's kind of the easiest way to describe this is you log in with your crypto wallet and then all of a sudden you create an account, right? Where, where in the olden days you would use like your email address or your phone number, right? To create an account. And now it's your crypto wallet. And then you can go in and you can join these different, um, communities, if you will. And, um, I love the token gating aspect of it. Cause I think there's a lot of people who are, have communities um that have DAOs or social nf or nfts or something like that and they want to figure out a way to have discussion and dialogue and what i like about what you've done is it's threaded dialogue right it's not it's not just like discord which is crazy like if someone responds to you you have to search to find it right <laughs> so we're going to talk more about what you're doing in a little bit but i want to come to this question um why is web3 worth paying attention to for businesses. So many of the people that are listening to this show right now are uh, marketers or they're entrepreneurs or they are creators who are trying to build a business and um, help them understand the value of how Web3 could really, from your perspective, um, change their business in a positive way. 
Yeah, so the way I would look at Web3 is it's kind of, it's foundationally like a new computing platform, right? So if you think about kind of like the development of uh, compute over time, right? Like in kind of like the 60s, you had like mainframes, then you kind of went to uh, PCs and desktop, then you had the internet, then you had like uh, the switch to mobile um, in like the late 2000s, um, right? And each of those kind of new developments enabled all these new use cases that you couldn't have really imagined. And then I, I personally view uh, Web3 and blockchain technology as the next stage, um, right? Like the next main innovation. And like the fundamental innovation there is that, right? If the internet made it so that you could kind of transfer information, so I could send you information instantaneously, um, blockchain makes it so that you could send people value instantaneously, right? And um, which is a massive unlock, right? right? Being able to send any amount of money you want anywhere in the world, in basically instantly is um, kind of wild. And you can do a lot of different things with that. And then also the other main innovation is that it, uh, it is, uh, I'm trying to think of a word to describe this. It's, it gives you hard commitments, right? So you have, um, you have, it's basically code that you can't change, right? And this is a fundamental like innovation because we've never had this before, right? Like every time, um, every single application you use or, um, uh, you're referring to the smart contract, right? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, exactly. Smart contracts, right? Like every piece of code or application you use is up until now has been controlled by somebody like Google or Facebook, right? Like some third party and they can change it whenever you want. But we've never before had a paradigm where you uh, have kind of code that can't be changed, right? And um, Chris Dixon at Andreessen Horowitz kind of says, instead of Google's don't be evil, it's can't be evil, right? So you just kind of just trust the code, right? So the perfect example of this is Bitcoin, right? There's code that anybody can go and look at and it kind of guarantees that there will never be more than 21 million uh, Bitcoins, right? And um, anybody can verify that and people can trust that, right? And up until now, um, you couldn't really have that guarantee, right? Because if that existed on say Facebook or Google server, people would just say, oh, you could change this anytime you want. But um, now because that code lives on thousands of different computers all verifying it, um, you can't change it. And that kind of, those hard guarantees create a lot of interesting primitives, right? Like you're seeing things like NFTs and, um, right? Like NFT. So the way I would look at it is I think people like often over index on, <laughs> on crypto. They're like, oh, everything has to be crypto um, if you're building a new project. But I, I personally think like the future will be a combination of both like traditional AWS compute and then crypto compute where you kind of, and that's kind of what we're doing at GM, right? You can use these like NFTs and social tokens and utility tokens in all these unique and interesting ways to add value to whatever application you're building. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. This whole concept of immutable, never changing contracts is um, hard to wrap your brain around, right? But, you know, that's why, for example, when you stake something, right, which is something I'm just beginning to wrap my head around, like it is what it is and it's not changeable. And once it's there, it's there and the contract is enforced until the time limit is up and then it's up. And um, that that opens up fascinating opportunities, I think. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is that um, a lot of the major social platforms and you probably know this, but I have another show called the Social Media Marketing Podcast and we cover all those platforms. And um, there are some challenges uh, from both a consumer and from a business perspective when you're using Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, dot, 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 dot. So let's talk a little bit about from your perspective as someone who's developing a decentralized or hopefully eventually decentralized social platform. You know, what is it about these social um, humongous companies that is creating challenges um, for all of us? What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, the issue that's kind of most top of mind right now with uh, kind of like what you're seeing um, going on with Twitter, right? And one thing that Elon is advocating for is kind of open sourcing the algorithm. So right now you basically write like the feed algorithm for all these Twitter users, right? So right, right now, basically you're seeing um, you have a handful of executives and product managers in Silicon Valley deciding what the whole, whole world sees and doesn't see, right? And like they're shadow banning users, they're flat out banning users. Um, they're um, kind of curtailing the distribution of some content and promoting other content. Um, and that's all very opaque right now. And no, the world doesn't really know what, what's going into that al algorithm right now and like 
how those decisions are being made, um, right? So uh, that's one major issue. It's just like kind of like the opaqueness and Elon's kind of proposing open sourcing that. Um, and that's kind of um, so that anybody could kind of see uh, what's going in to these kind of feed algorithms. So that's one main issue. So kind of like the censorship issue and um, deciding what the whole world sees and doesn't see. Yeah, what else? What are some other challenges? Because I know we talked about data before and we talked about innovation and value sharing and all that kind of stuff. So feel free to hit up any of those. Yeah, so also like innovation is, um, uh, right, it, it kind of uh, halts innovation, right? It, or it prevents a lot of innovation because it's very hard to build a social network from scratch, right? So if you disagree with, I don't know, Twitter's feed algorithm or Facebook using ads to monetize rather than maybe paid subscriptions, right? That is more closely aligned with user incentives. People can't go out and express that view without building an entirely new uh, social media network from scratch, which is extremely hard to do, right? So, um, and the primary reason that can't do that is because Facebook owns the data, right? So if I wanted to create a Facebook competitor, I, it would be very hard for me to do that because um, I could, right? If any like pretty technical engineer, um, could kind of create a Facebook clone. And you could go on YouTube and you could see all these different clones, how to create Facebook clone, how to create Instagram clone. Um, but like you could create this clone and something that works exactly uh, like the existing applications, but nobody will use it because all my friends are on Facebook, right? And I can't kind of access that data. But what, what you do by kind of opening up that data pool and giving anybody read and write access to it, um, it allows anybody to uh, create a competitive offering uh, Versus Facebook, right? So I can leverage, I can build an application that like, I don't know, we could call it like Facebook too, or Bookface or whatever, right? I create Bookface and it reads all that data. So you log into my application and all your friends are there, all their content's there, all their pictures are there. Um, but maybe like the feed, instead of trying to get you to spend a ton of time on it, maybe it just um, kind of like lets you know when you're caught up on like the most pressing matters. And then like you could get back to your day after 30 minutes, right? Um, or, or maybe like it charges you um, to use the application and then it doesn't show you ad advertisements, right? Um, so you can, or like another example would be kind of, it's kind of ridiculous that you have these US-based companies um, creating the clients for every person around the world, right? So if I, <laughs> it probably makes sense like for the people of India to have um, uh, an application tailored to their needs um, built by like Indian engineers, right? Or, any, if the data pool is open and then any engineer can kind of build a competitive client to that, you could have a proliferation of clients that better best address different value systems and different cultures and like different kind of preferences of these different cultures as well. So like it stifles the innovation. And then like the third thing would kind of be value capture, right? Is there's no, um, right? Like because Facebook, Twitter and Reddit have these data monopolies, uh, they don't really have to worry about a lot of competition, right? And so they can kind of do whatever they want and one thing that they're currently doing is they're capturing 100% of the revenue, right? The advertising revenue. And they're not really sharing that with the users, uh, which is kind of fundamentally unfair in my view, because the users create all that value. And then Chris Dixon at, and Jason Horowitz actually wrote a great thread on this called Your Take Rate is My Opportunity, um, kind of playing off of uh, Jeff Bezos's Your Margin is My Opportunity. Um, and basically arguing that, um, Returning this value to the users can be a way to kind of get people to switch from these existing networks to your network, right? And like entrepreneurs will be tackling that in the future. And that's one of the things we're trying to tackle too. I've been on Twitter for a long time. Um, and I remember in the early days, they didn't really have an official app. You were using other people's apps. They just had an API, right? And their data was open and everybody could use it. And there were all these great free tools that you could use to analyze what was going on on Twitter. And uh, over time, they continued to restrict and restrict the API to the point where you couldn't even, they wouldn't allow you to, um, for example, we're a publisher, so we used to have this retweet counter that was on our website. Well, they restricted the API so that you couldn't actually see how many times an article was retweeted, right? And then they got to the point where they started innovating new features that were only available in the Twitter app, right? So what ended up happening was it was kind of an open ecosystem in the beginning. Uh, open to developers at least. And then over time, it became a closed, closed, closed ecosystem to now, really, you have to use their app or apps, you know, and there's no other option, you know, and they've become, like you said, kind of uh, all the innovation has to happen on their platform and they've locked out the rest of the world. And I think that um, I get the sense that 
in the world of Web3, where we're trying to go towards is more of open systems and open sharing so everybody can evade on top of everybody else. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, exactly. Um, right? Like Twitter started closing their APIs as soon as it started eating into their advertising revenue, right? So you kind of like originally had this original commitment to saying, hey, anybody can build on top of our data. And then as soon as it wasn't in their favor and like the network effects are strong that uh, it gave them power, they kind of took that back, right? And that kind of goes back to what we were originally talking about with the, instead of don't be evil, it can't be evil, right? And then you could have kind of code that commits to not changing over time, right? And then it kind of gives developers the assurances they need to build on top of that. Okay, um, you have made public statements that you are um, moving towards something called progressive decentralization. So what I would love you to do is kind of explain a little bit for our audience that is not super techie and super developers, why you have to start in your case as centralized and then how your plan is to become ultimately decentralized and kind of what that is and what why that's important in the world of Web3. Sure. Uh, so the... The term progressive decentralization was, I, I believe, is like originally coined by Blasi Srinivasan. Um, and then it was popularized by Jesse Walden, who is at, um, he used to be a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, now he's at Variant, um, running that venture fund. Um, but the basic premise of progressive decentralization is crypto founders kind of have to do two things, right? Like A, like they have to build something people want and find product market fit. And then B, they kind of have to decentralize governance and turn ownership and control over to the community if they're kind of really going to build a permissionless protocol, right? So those are two really, really hard problems. And it's kind of, and we've seen, there's a lot of failed projects out there who that like try to tackle both at the same time and they end up going nowhere, right? So what progressive decentralization argues is that first protocol should really focus on finding product market fit right? And building something useful that people want. And in order to do that, you really need centralized leadership, right? You need to be running experiments. You need to be moving fast. And if you kind of look at DAO, like DAOs are a perfect example of kind of decentralized governance, um, right? They move really slow. There's lots of arguments. There's nobody really taking control or being decisive. Um, and you lose a lot of the advantages of um, being a startup, right? Like as a startup, if we're trying to compete against Twitter, Reddit, and Facebook, our biggest advantage is speed, right? And you kind of need centralized leadership for that. So to and progressively decentralize it, you start by solving for product market fit. And then stage two is to kind of build a community around your product and you start running it like an open source project, right? So once we have, let's just say our product is working, right? We have clear signs of product market fit, like retention is where it needs to be, growth is um, where we want it to be. Then we can start kind of running it similar to an open source project where people, we can put bounties for people to build out certain features or uh, do community management work or operations work, right? And then we can start, um, building out the community. And then once you kind of put in place, uh, right, there's a lot of things you have to put in place for that. You have to kind of create processes around that facilitate people to kind of contribute to the platform. And then you also have to create ways of incentivizing that. And how do you create it in a sustainable way so that it doesn't flame out or you don't like lose direction, right? So that that's the second part. And then the third part is once you have product market fit, you have a sustainable community and processes in place, then you kind of turn um, ownership and control over the network um, via a lot of people do this via some sort of governance token and distributing ownership and then allowing people to kind of and like creating a treasury to fund future operations and then allowing people to kind of vote and steer that and then the other thing that also uh, protects the entrepreneur against is kind of securities laws right so securities laws are a big issue right now a lot of people are kind of just ignoring securities laws and like launching a token anyway and say we'll figure it out later um, which is really risky um, because um, there's this thing called the Howey test, which kind of defines if a token is a security and not a security. And because most of these projects are dependent on people's efforts, um, they are they technically are securities. Um, so by progressively decentralizing, and once it's kind of decentralized to a point where it doesn't depend on the core team's efforts, then it um, it's it's on a spectrum, right? So it's not uh, black and white. But um, once you reach a point of sufficient decentralization, there comes a point where um, that the potential token would transition from being a security to not being a security, right? It'd be like property, like Ethereum or Bitcoin. And then that helps you get around securities laws as well. So what is your plans, if you don't mind sharing, like um, to, I mean, like tell us without getting super technical, like what's your, what's your plan to decentralize with GM? 
Uh, yeah, so we've communicated this to, right? Like it's probably the number one question uh, the community asks us, right? So what's our plan for decentralizing? Um, the first is to find product market fit, right? So we're right now we're trying to build a useful social network that, and we're getting communities to join and we're building out all this functionality that these communities need. And right, and you, in order to do that, you kind of need centralized leadership and you need somebody uh, taking control. Right, so we're doing that at first, and then once we have product market fit, we're going to kind of put processes in place. Like we'll open source uh, parts of our code base, put start putting out bounties for and allowing people to contribute, and then start building like that community and like those processes in place for kind of sustainable um, uh, kind of governance. Um, and then we also, but before we, so the stages are one, find product market fit. Stage two is to de decentralize the data layer. So by that, what we mean is. Going back to the Twitter example from from before, um, allowing anybody to read and write to our data, um, right? With at, and kind of giving guarantees that we won't change it um, on them later, like Twitter did, right? So that's the second right. problem we need to solve. And then the third problem will kind of be decentralizing governance, right? And turning ownership um, and control over to the community and really building like a timeless protocol. How long do you think it's going to take? Years. St Definitely years. Um, yeah, so finding product market fit alone is really, really hard, <laughs> right? Like building something that's, comp right? Like if you look at who we're competing against, we're competing against Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, uh, right? Like these are tremendously well-staffed and well-resourced uh, giant companies um, that we're trying to compete against. Um, but we have some traction now. Once we get to a point where we feel like, hey, there's not that much that needs to change, it's mostly in terms of like execution, we kind of have processes in place and we have like a long-term roadmap developed for it. Um, yeah, so if I had to guess something like 18, 24 months, I don't know. I hate giving time estimates, um, but like for that product market fit stage. And then, um, and then the great thing about waiting is that, um, best practices on how to decentralize the data layer are going to change a lot, um, over time, right? Like if you look at kind of, um, uh, decentralized architecture right now, it's probably in the, somewhere in like the 1960s in terms of development, uh, <laughs> um, in terms of like compute development of like actually like storing data and reading and writing from it. Um, right. In web two, traditional web two tech, right. You've had 50 years of investment in all like the data servers of Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and like all these ginormous and AWS, right. All this ginormous investment into it. And right. And like, uh, crypto is kind of still in the first inning in terms of decentralized architecture. So that's like another benefit of waiting is that you've had some protocols like Lens Protocol or DSO Protocol that build their own L1 um, and uh, they're storing all the data on that. Um, and the problem with that is that as an engineer, it's just really hard to build on, um, right? It, slow, it, slows down, it slows down your engineering team a lot, something that should take a couple of days, now takes a month, right? Because you have to build on like this really tough uh, underdeveloped architecture. Um, so by waiting, we can just say, best practices for how to kind of decentralize your architecture are going to look drastically different in the next six, six months, let alone like 18 months. Right. Um, so by waiting, we, um, can allow some like other really smart people to, um, make advancements and decentralize architecture. What I, what I like about your stance that you are intentionally trying to decentralize is it does send a strong signal to the community that this is not going to be one of those kind of projects that, is trying to be the next Facebook, right? Because obviously you are embracing Web3 principles and there's going to be alternatives that are gonna be highly centralized and they're gonna claim that they are quote unquote um, Web3 when they're really not Web3. And I think it's kind of exciting what you're building here. Um, I wanna talk about what GM is a little bit more. Um, let me start with uh, who is using it uh, now and what are some of the applications and who do you envision using it um, down downstream? Yeah. Um, so right now, the way we're kind of positioning it is most communities will have kind of public communications and internal communications, right? So if I'm kind of, um, I don't know, anything, right? Like, so one of the most popular communities on GM right now is the On the Brink podcast, which is a podcast that Nick Carter and Matt Walsh um, and Rhea do um, on kind of like the latest uh, developments in crypto. They interview great founders and they do a weekly roundup of all the news. Um, and they are using GM as a place for their community, um, right? So it's a place where the community can kind of keep up with what's going on, right? Like they have a place to discuss latest episodes and talk to Matt and Nick and Rhea um, and follow along with that community. 
uh, right? And uh, the main difference versus if you try to do that in Discord, right? So right now, everybody's using Discord for that, which is a nightmare, right? Because um, I, I don't know if most of your audience has used Discord, but basically the way Discord works is every community that you're remotely interested in forces you to join their Discord server. And then that's the only way you can kind of keep up. And each Discord server basically is a string of uh, chat rooms, right? So if I'm in, if I have like 50 communities that I'm kind of interested in, I have to check all 50 of those communities. And then all 50 of those communities have like 20 channels that I have to check individually. And they're all like basically like chat group, chat channels, right? So that's, so 50 on 20, right? Like that's- And it's a nightmare because you could miss some really important information, right? Like this is the challenge is they don't have email communication at all that I'm aware of. If they do, I shut it off, but I don't think they do. And if you don't keep up on stuff in some of these NFT communities, you could miss the opportunity for a free airdrop or getting whitelisted or whatever. And it's like, literally is like a nightmare. Um, so keep going. <laughs> no, that's exactly it, right? So like if there's 50 servers and then each server has 20 channels, that's a thousand places I have to check every morning just to stay on top of my community. So it's obviously I can't do, uh, right? And then I personally have all of my servers muted just because they all send a ton of notifications and I, 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 did, I just can't deal with it, right? So like if you could contrast that to GM, right? Like GM, I go to the on the brink community and I haven't uh, been there in a week or a month, right? I could just say, I could just sort it by upvotes or most discussed and say, show me the most discussed or the top conversations that happen in this community over the past week or month, right? And I could do that across all of my communities, right? So if I'm a member of 50 communities on GM, I have a central home feed that I could kind of like sort by upvotes and like just uh, scan pretty easily and the conversations are grouped. Whereas if you, in Discord, the only really way to get, if you're not there for a month, the only way to get caught up is to read all the messages chronologically. Um, back to when you were last online, right? To tell if you missed something, which is uh, a nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are like um, some of the main benefits and communities are starting to realize it, right? Like, so Discord works great for your internal team. Like if we need to hash something out quickly, right? Like we used to use Discord for our internal team, like the engineers and like the um, our designer, we would just hash things out and like, it's great for getting a hold of people quickly, but most communication doesn't need to be synchronous. Most of it can be asynchronous. So it's what what uh, GM is really good for is for engaging with your um, the more passive community members and then new community members, people who come to your community and want to get caught up but they don't know where to start, right? Like it's really helpful if you can kind of sort things by most popular or um, by relevance to you. Uh, a couple questions I want to ask you: um, Is everything token gated? Is that how it works? You have to you you know you have to have a token to be able to get into these communities or can anyone host something on there without having a token? How does that work? Yeah, so it's almost nothing is token gated. What we do token gate is like the initial sign up. We make sure you have some ETH in your wallet um, just to protect uh, the platform from spam. Um, but outside of that, most of the, right, like on the brain community, Coinbetrix community, Analyst DAO community, um, all these communities, anybody could go join them and join in the discussion. Um, but they, 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 can, have, they can be token gated though, right? That is an option, is it not or no? Yes, they can, right? So we have, so an example of a token gated community is that there's this Bonsai NFT community, right? So they're just like little NFT, uh, NFTs of Bonsai trees and you have to own one to join the community and participate. So it's kind of a cool way to engage with like people who also own this NFT and have a shared interest um, with you. Um, what, where I ultimately think this is going to go is that most communities are going to want to be public. And then there's these things called topics, which are kind of like Discord channels in GM. And you'll be able to gate those and gate, uh, read and write permissions to specific topics based on the assets you own, right? So you don't have to, so anybody has a way to kind of, right? Like, so, so for example, right? The problem with the bonsai community is like the entire thing is gated. So, right, like if I'm new to it, and I want to see like, hey, is this something I might be interested in? There's no way for me to really plug into that community and for that community to grow, which is why we're seeing most communities start off public. Um, but where I, I think the perfect combination of that will be like, hey, some stuff is public, right? Like, and you can kind of see what the community is about and plug in. But for people who are actively contributing and who own the assets, right, they have, they can go deeper in the community and they have certain privileges that most members do not have because they own that asset. Okay, so this is fascinating. So first of all, you said you have to have a little bit of ETH in your wallet. Is this to stop spammers and bots from coming in? Is that kind of what you're implying there? Yeah, so, um, right, like bots are a massive issue on Twitter. Anybody could just spin up as many email addresses as they want. I think I get 
probably like 10 notifications a day from just bots that I have no interest in on Twitter. Um, and we kind of wanted to create an extremely high quality community, um, at least to start. And uh, it's kind of a crude metric to just say, hey, you have to have some ETH in your wallet to join. Uh, but it kind of like works for now. And then eventually we want to come up with a more sophisticated measure um, to allow you. And like, that, it's actually not a hard requirement, right? So if somebody signs up and they don't have any ETH, um, right? I get it, gas fees really high. It probably costs like 10 bucks to transfer some ETH into a wallet. Um, you can just email us and we'll just add you. So that's an option right. too. And the email just kind of like proves you're a real person and not a bot. Um, we did run in, this is actually another cool thing about, right? Like going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation is like, we have all these cool web three primitives that we can use in unique and interesting ways, right? Like Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook can't really solve this problem because they, people can just create as many email addresses or even phone numbers as they want, right? Using Google voice. Um, with us, you can kind of require that you own certain assets, right? And like kind of prove that you're a real human. Um, there's also like kind of projects, interesting projects like Proof of Humanity that are working on proving that people are real humans. Um, but it kind of opens up the design space to solve these hard problems because like initially anybody could sign up with empty wallets. And then we had people kind of create a ton of bots um, and span the platform. And we had we wanted to protect the platform from that. So that because it's kind of like this, it's this nascent community, right? And we want to make sure it's like very high quality. Um, so we created that ETH requirement and it actually solved it pretty well. Like if you look at it, the community is pretty high quality and, and like uh, it's all real people <laughs> engaging in dialogue and no bots. So right now, if somebody wanted to create a community, their own community on GM.xyz, uh, it sounds like you said it's a manual process right now, but it can be done, right? Or is it, or is it mostly, um, people going on there and looking for other communities, but right now, you know, I mean, help me understand, like, what's the predominant use cases? There are a series of communities, kind of the equivalent of groups, if you will, that people get a chance to join when they when they first create their account on GM.xyz. And then on a select case by case basis, you will allow them to create their own quote unquote communities on there. Is that how it works today? Yeah, exactly. Right. So I sign up and then there's a bunch of cool and interesting communities for me to join. Right. Um, we have to build kind of better discovery tools. Right. Like you can imagine recommending. Uh, right. If you sign up and you have a, you own a board eight, right. It, in, it instantly recommends like the board eight community or the Yuga labs community to you. Right. Like we could do cool stuff around that. Uh, but right now, yeah, you join the communities. And then if you want to create a community, um, you fill out, we just have like a Google form that anybody could fill out and like explain what the community is about, why you want to create it, what, where the community currently lives, um, why you want to use GM. And then I'll hop on a phone call with them and kind of like just discuss it with them and just like try and set them up for success. Um, just because otherwise, like if people, we just let people kind of create as many communities without kind of talking them through it, you'd end up with a lot of dead communities, like what Reddit has, right? So, um, yeah, it's a very manual process right now, but kind of following, um, I don't know if your audience is familiar with Paul Graham. He has this great essay called do things that don't scale. Um, and we're kind of embracing that motto. So earlier you mentioned that you could have a public community, um, but you could also, I, I think I heard you say that you could token gate sections of that community, right? So for example, social media examiners got a really huge communities on a lot of the other social platforms. We could set up a social media examiner or social media marketing world community for our conference attendees. And then for those that hold our NFT, there could be a, a, a special gated, uh, section in there, just like there is in discord. Is that kind of how that's working right now today? Yes. No. It's not live today. Um, it should be live in the next few weeks, though. We're actually working through designs. Yeah, so it's coming. Um, but yes, that's exactly it, right? And like the benefit of that is that you don't close the entire community, right? And stifle kind of like the growth of the community. Um, it gives kind of new potential new members a way to plug in and see what the community is about and uh, meet some people. And then it also kind of, I, I think it's the best of both worlds because it gives the kind of like the, the asset owners, right? Like the people who do own your asset and or maybe like longtime community members um special privileges like maybe they get to engage with you right and like you'll answer all their questions on a certain topic i want to talk about uh the chains that you support right now um and and po apps and all that kind of stuff so so what are you currently supporting um as far as nft stuff goes and then what's coming down the pipeline yeah so if you go on gm all all of your ethereum mainnet nfts will be on your um, profile along with your POAPs. Um, so POAP is proof of attendance protocol. Um, and it's kind of like badges of 
Eventually. Do the, do the Po apps, are they on there only if you transfer them over to the Ethereum mainnet or are they also on there because your interface, you know how Po apps, when you get a Po app, they let you get one and then, you know, you get it instantly. But if you want to transfer it over to the Ethereum mainnet, that costs you gas. So is there some sort of interface where it works with all Po apps or is it just the ones that have been transferred over to the Ethereum mainnet? It's all Po apps right now. So all your Po apps that you own will show up on your profile. Um, and then, yeah, we want to integrate um other chains as well right so next off will probably be polygon and then maybe solana after that based on just user interest and what users are asking us for um the way we kind of viewed it is we were like okay let's let's just build something that works with ethereum and then once we have something that's working um and then we get to the point where users are kind of being gated right where they can't participate or like um we want to appeal to a larger number of users we can kind of um start integrating other chains, um, other L1s, um, maybe Ethereum L2s, and kind of bring in those cohorts of users. There's a big chunk of my audience that has no idea what a PO app is. Could, would you mind explaining kind of what it is from your understanding and maybe some of the use cases for it? Um, yeah, sure. So a PO app is basically... Um, it's kind proof of, of attendance protocol, right? Yeah, it's proof of attendance protocol. So it's basically an NFT. And a lot of people, it's very cheap to mint. Um, right, so you don't have to pay crazy gas fees. Um, it's on, they're on their own um, kind of L1 chain. Um, and then if I go to, a, right, like a lot, of, a lot of conferences will use them, right? So if I went to ETH Denver, they sent me an ETH Denver PO app, kind of like proof, proving that I was there, right? And then I could kind of connect with other people who own that PO app, right? And like, hey, we were both at ETH Denver um, in 2021. Or um, another example would be, I know Bankless, uh, the Bankless newsletter, they will give uh, PO apps to every year for people that uh, are subscribers to their newsletter. So, so people could say, I've been a subscriber of uh, Bankless newsletter since 2019, right? Um, and kind of kind of stuff like that to kind of prove, we, we actually issued PO apps to the first 1,000 users on GM, right? Because it's kind of cool. If GM ends up being like the next Facebook or Twitter, right? You could say, hey, I was the first 1,000 users on GM, right? And you could prove it that um, otherwise you it's kind of word of mouth. Like, how do you really prove something like that? So that's what PoApps basically allow for. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because I've got just, I don't have a lot. I've got like three of them. Mostly it seems like conferences are using them after the conference is over with kind of as a proof that you were there. And it kind of looks like a little sticker that you can collect. But I love the fact that you are taking PoApps and using them potentially as token gated access, you know, to, to I mean, with what you're developing, right? Uh, to maybe exclusive little sections of your community. And I'm also excited about the fact that you seem to be adapting adopting the same um, chains that uh, OpenSea is adopting, right? So first it was Ethereum, then it was uh, Polygon, and now it's Solana. And, you know, obviously as they begin adapting and maybe normalizing some of these NFT platforms, blockchains or whatever, I would imagine you're going to also work to bring those in because... I mean, I really do think people might look to you as an alternative to Discord, right? Um, is there private messaging, by the way, built into it, or is it all public? Explain that a little bit. Yeah, so there's uh, private direct messaging, right? So, so I can go and if you're on there and I like your comment or I like your NFT collection, I could shoot you a DM and say, hey, um, I love your NFT collection, um, right? And it's private right now. We eventually are talking about um, doing kind of chat topics within communities, right? So you could have a gated... Um, topic within um, each kind of like subreddit. The best way to think of a community is like a subreddit, but like a chat group for people with certain roles or tokens um, that can join in the chat, similar to Discord. And is it desktop only right now? It is desktop only, but uh, we are actually hoping to have a test flight app out on iOS and Android in the next 10 days or so. Uh, uh, and yeah. then uh, a full-fledged application um, in iOS and Android stores uh probably in like the next three to four weeks i don't know I, I hate giving estimates um but my brother uh my brother matt has done um and he i think he started on it like two or three weeks ago right so he's basically building native ios and android clients in a month which is kind of crazy um as people are listening to this that time may have already gone by so you might want to go search for it i would imagine they would just search for gm dot gm dot xyz just because it's better for search if somebody yeah, yeah yeah, you might end up with um, kind of like a car app if, <laughs> if you just search GM. Where do you see uh, where do you see this whole industry going? I mean, like put your 
put your thinking cap on five years from now. And I know that's crazy because five years ago, like was so different than it is right now, but where do you see this industry going in the next five years from your perspective as a developer who's actively inside of this community? Yeah. Um, and honestly, it's tough, such a tough question. The easy answer is I actually think ETH, um, I could see ETH kind of being a global reserve asset. So that I, that, that would be like my most confident prediction. <laughs> and, um, what about from, like, from a business perspective? Where where do you think the world of business is going specifically with all this crypto stuff? What's your thoughts on this and and communities? You can talk about that as well. Yeah, I I mean right like I I think Web three gives cool ways to transfer and capture value that weren't possible before, and I think they'll be combined in interesting ways with traditional Web two applications, right? So I don't think like Web three. I hate like right. There's a certain. Um, I don't know, it's kind of like marketing almost where with Web3 like implies an in inevitable transition from Web2. I think it'll be a mix, just kind of like how the um, the mobile revolution, right? Just because everybody has phones now doesn't mean computers are dead, right? I'm taking this call from my laptop. Everybody still uses laptops, right? It'll be kind of in combination. Uh, people will be using both. And that's how I picture Web3 going where, right? Like kind of like a pot. I, I bet most podcasts in the future have some sort of NFT that kind of like allows people to kind of like share ownership, um, right? Like music industry will probably be another one, right? Like you can imagine, right? You see Ed Sheeran, the, the example that everybody uses is like, you see, you see Ed Sheeran at a bar, right? Like before he was even famous and you buy his NFT of his song, right? And then which kind of gives you maybe streaming rights to or royalties um, from that song in the future. And then like you're, you help support him. And then like if Ed Sheeran takes off, then you can kind of share in that upside with him. Um, the main thing is that it really allows is it kind of gives people equity, right, in each other. And it makes it really easy to transfer equity and issue equity in each other. And you run into a lot of securities issues, but I, I feel like securities laws are kind of archaic right now. I mean, we're use, literally using the Howey test from like the 1940s and they need to change. Um, but uh, that would be my view is that um, you see these basic primitives, like cool primitives like NFT, NFTs and smart contracts um, providing kind of commitments and cool primitives um, in existing in uh, combined with like tra traditional web two applications. Uh, Michael McGinnis, if people want to discover more about uh, your product, they can go to gm.xyz. Um, if they want to reach out to you, is there a preferred social platform or website you want to, you want to send them to? Twitter, what's the best place that people want to reach out to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my Twitter handle is Mike McG0, Mike -E -M -G Zero. Then all my contact information, like- hey, Can you say that one that. more time? Just say that one more time, just because it was a little uh, wonky right there when you said it. So say your Twitter ID one more time, please. Sure, sorry. Um, it was Mike McG0, M-I-K-E-M-C-G-0. Um, and then um, all my contact information is at my personal website. It's michaelmcginnis.com. Um, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-M-C-G-U-I-N-E-S-S.com. Michael, thank you so much for uh, coming on and answering all my questions. Um, I wish you the best with GM.xyz and uh, uh, really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you so, for, so much for having me. This was, uh, this was fun and a lot of great questions.